Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Fluorescence Molecular Imaging in Head and Neck Cancer Patients. I am Marie Stone of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Andor. To learn more, visit andor.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Flores Vascal, MD, PhD, postdoctoral researcher, Head and Neck Surgical Oncology, University Medical Center, Groningen, the Netherlands. Dr. Vascal, you may now begin your presentation. Thanks, Marie, for a kind introduction. Uh, again, my name is Flores, and uh, it's an uh, honor to uh, present the work we uh, we do in Groningen, the Netherlands, the most northern um, city in the Netherlands. Uh, of course, this is not only my work, but uh, of the whole uh, optical imaging group. You will see some uh, some of those people at the end of my presentation in the acknowledgments. Uh, but I have the honor to uh, to present um, uh, some of the work we uh, we do. So uh, please feel free to to ask some questions also during the presentation. If I uh, get a, a pop up in my screen, I will try to uh, to answer them immediately, and otherwise uh, we discuss it at the end of the presentation. I have no conflict conflict of interest, so um, don't worry about it. And I want to start with the movie, and um, I'm going to talk you through. So here you see a bush and under the water, and this is how we surgeons uh, um, usually see the surgical cavity during a cancer surgery. So it all looks the same and uh, no idea where the cancer is. Um, and then um, it would be a lot easier when uh, uh, the cancer lights up like this, um, this fish is doing as well. So this is also a really uh, nice example of how we, uh, we try to improve cancer surgery by lighting up the, the target tissue, uh, uh, which um, enables us to uh, delineate and, and, and excise radically the, the tumor. Here again, um, you can see it in slow motion, but I think you all uh, got it now. And I hope I'm still muted, yes. So fluorescence guided surgery, it's uh, um, almost an uh, era already uh, uh, old and it was first used in uh, in the uh, um, in the eye uh, with an uh, sodium fluorescent and in uh, the 2011 uh, the first study was published uh, about uh, clinical uh, fluorescence uh, guided surgery by, uh, by our group uh, professor van dam uh, um, which um, investigates the uh, ovarian uh, cancer uh, metastasis in the in the abdominal cavity um, and, and by then, the fluorescence has uh, um, uh, interest in fluorescence surgery has increased uh, tremendously, and um, I will I will talk about that later as well. So, what can we do with optical imaging? And in my uh, uh, specific field, fluorescence guided imaging. So we can uh, um, uh, obtain margin control for cancer surgery uh, during surgery and after surgery. We can detect tumor lesions uh, of which we didn't know they uh, they were present, or we didn't know the exact location of the the tumor press, uh, tumor um, lesion. We could visualize the drugs when we label them with fluorescence. That's uh, um, of course of interest when you perform surgery, but also in uh, clinical drug development, um, you can uh, uh, label uh, uh, your your drug of interest and microdose it to the patient, and then you can uh, can investigate the actual uh, location uh, in the in the target uh, tissue. Uh, we can uh, improve the histopathological diagnosis, so the pathologist can use it as well. And during surgery, we can uh, visualize uh, some critical anatomical structures like the um, large veins or or nerves, etc. 
Uh, and my, my interest is uh, mainly focused on the interoperative margin control and tumor detection, um, uh, of which I will, uh, uh, for which I will continue my, my talk. So it's always good to look back a bit. Um, in 2007, our group started uh, performing uh, clinical studies on fluorescence-guided imaging. Um, this was a study uh, which I already mentioned, uh, investigating ovarian cancer. This is when how it looked uh, by then. It was uh, custom-made uh, by, by our group in, in close collaboration with the group of Munich, the Technical University of Munich, uh, with Bacillus. Uh, Nisa Grisos, uh, uh, as a group uh, leader there. You see it on the left, our first clinical camera, and you see a very uh, large uh, device uh, in, the, in the OR, uh, which is covered with a sterile drape to, uh, to get interoperative uh, uh, images. Um, of course, we, uh, we did some uh, modifications, some, some companies started uh, with um, uh, startups and skills up, skill up. One of them is uh, Search Vision, which is now uh, uh, um, taken over by Breco. Uh, here you see the, the camera we, which we use a lot. It's the Search Vision Explorer Air. It all looks a bit, bit nicer than, uh, than uh, 2007. Uh, and in fact, it uh, does work also a bit better. Uh, we got um, uh, two of them in, uh, in, uh, at our uh, place. And uh, a couple of years ago, we developed uh, together with Search Vision the, the, um, the Vault, which is a uh, kind of black box, and you can couple it to the uh, to the camera head, and um, it um, yeah, generates a more standardized uh, um, imaging um, field with no uh, um, environmental light or or different angles um, or um, different distances from tumor to, to camera head. And I will talk about that later, why we think that's important. And once the tissue is excised, we mostly use the pearl from the Lycor, uh, which is um, developed as a um, small animal uh, um, imager, but with some uh, custom uh, um, uh, made changes. Uh, it's very nicely a device um, to perform uh, uh, fluorescence imaging on the excised tissue specimen. So most of the images you will see are obtained by these, uh, these devices. So fluorescence guided surgery. Um, as mentioned, uh, it's a rapid progression of the field. And uh, by 2011, we, we published the first uh, in-human uh, study. And by then, it, it, it's gone like a uh, completely massive growth. Uh, and I updated this slide uh, last week. And we, we now see uh, more than 350 clinical studies investigating uh, fluorescent guided surgery, with a lot of phase three studies uh, going on now. Um, so so this, this shows that there's a lot of interest in this field. And uh, there's a clearly uh, uh, a need for, for better detection uh, methods during uh, cancer surgery, uh, but also during other types of surgery or, or clinical um, practice. So why, why should we use those uh, techniques in cancer surgery? Now, we, we know, and, and we know it already for a long time, that we see unchanged high prevalence of uh, tumor positive margins, many solid tumor types, uh, um, to be honest. and we. Uh, on the, on the graph on the right, you can see that uh, um, the, the past 20 years, um, the, the tumor positive margin rates are, are not changed that much and, and definitely not increased um, or, or improved, I have to say, uh, dramatically um, where you might expect it because we, we have so much new technologies and scans and CTs and MRIs. But, all those those uh, tumor positive margins uh, rates in in these these solid cancer types um, yeah, don't change that much, and in fact they, they the the line is completely flat uh, in my opinion. And I'm mostly uh, interested in the oral cavity. Um, I'm a resident head and neck surgery, so we uh, we perform surgery on the on the oral cavity, the tongue, the, the mandible, the floor of the mouth, uh, the cheek, etc. Um, and we know that, that um, the surgical uh, treatment in the head of neck cancer, um, the surgical margin is one of the most important uh, prognosticators for, for survival. 
and we know that uh, unfortunately we face a, a very high amount of, uh, of inadequate margins um, where the goal is to obtain a, a free margin of at least five millimeters around the tumor we see that uh, around 20 to 30 percent we, we face a positive margin so we we cut out the tissue without a margin or with one millimeter or less margin and we see a, a very high amount of closed margins with this one or one to five millimeter healthy tissue around the around the tumor lesion and if we face an inadequate margin which is uh, correlated to an uh, um, um, worse prognosis it is indicated um, that an uh, adjuvant treatment uh, consists of uh, chemo radiation, which comes with a lot of uh, um, severe side effects for the patients. It comes with increased local recurrence rates, and it comes with with increased dis disease uh, specific death rates. So it's uh, it's our task to uh, to reduce those uh, inadequate margin numbers. So here again, what are those margins for the for the non-clinical uh, attendees? You see the cancer lesion in uh, in purple, and um, the goal is to obtain at least uh, five millimeters of tumor free tumor free surgical margin, which is uh, shown on the left. And a tumor positive margin is when you cut through the tumor, as the image on the right shows, but also when you have less than one millimeter um, healthy tissue around the around the tumor lesion. And that is that we believe that when you get that close to the tumor margin, there are always uh, very small micrometastases around those uh, uh, tumor lesions that we can't see um, and which might affect uh, the local recurrence rates. So if we face a tumor positive margin, uh, adjuvant uh, therapy is necessary, as mentioned uh, in the previous slide. <laughs> so why then optical uh, imaging in cancer surgery? Because of the current interoperative guidance isn't uh, um, sufficient. We use preoperative imaging, we use visual and tactile information during surgery, we use fresh frozen sectoring during surgery, which is obtaining a, a biopsy and then immediately processed, which is immediately processed by the pathology department. However, these compass very these techniques come with um, um, uh, yeah, problems for for guidance uh, um, during the surgery. The preoperative imaging, like the CT and MRI scan, are are not not real time, and we know, especially in head and neck cancer, that those uh, cancer lesions can grow very fast. So uh, imagine that that you uh, perform an MRI scan like one or two weeks uh, prior to surgery, the situation might have changed, and the uh, patient is is like uh, is is different um, positioned. At the, at the operation table. So uh, the correlation between the, the preoperative imaging and the real-time uh, situation um, isn't that good. Then during surgery, the, surgery, the surgeon uses most of um, uh, the information he gets from visual and technical information. And, and we know, and, and we all can know, and you can know that that a really low resolution of the human eye. It comes with a low positive predictive value and low neg negative pre predictive value. So you can think, okay, we obtain during surgery some uh, some uh, biopsies which are uh, immediately uh, analyzed by the pathology department. The problem is again how to choose which areas you want to investigate using those biopsies, uh, and that, that comes with a high uh, sampling bias because you 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 make a selection again based on your 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 visual and tactile information. And we know that these these rapid uh, processed biopsies are um, um, low of quality. So how, how can fluorescence then uh, then assist? Um, we, we think it can uh, um, assist the, the clinician prior to surgery, so it can enhance the the early diagnosis, um, um, which which might uh, lead to a less extensive surgery when you when the tumor is still small and you already um, visualize it with fluorescence, uh, you can uh, go for less um, dramatic treatment. You can screen for satellite lesions because we know in head and neck uh, area there's a high chance of a second uh, tumor lesion. And during surgery, it can assist us in uh, delineation of the tumor. It can uh, help us in uh, margin assessment. And again, it, we can screen uh, satellite lesions. So from uh, no information, um, we think we should light up the tumor, uh, which gives us um, uh, information prior to the incision, during the surgery, and after the surgery. 
in a surgical cavity, as you can see on the, the right, uh, right bottom image. If there's a um, fluorescent spot left, that might um, be tumor um, which is left. And, and during surgery, during the initial surgery, it's often way more easy to uh, do a re immediate reaccession than uh, a couple of days after. So a lot of um, uh, strategies um, for fluorescence guided imaging are, are present. You can uh, either choose the non-targeted uh, uh, imaging, uh, for example, using IgG, which is a lot of which is a lot done in the, the liver surgery, for example. You can use antibodies, peptides, uh, smart activatables, uh, pH activatables. Um, um, our colleagues uh, Hansen and De Jong have written a very nice uh, review paper about it um, on the different compounds used in fluorescent imaging. And uh, this presentation is um, focused on um, two of those uh, strategies, the antibodies and the, uh, the pH activatable. And uh, first I would like to start with the antibody uh, strategy. In this study we have used uh, the cetuximab 800CW which is a monoclonal antibody targeting EGFR, uh, labeled with the fluorescent uh, compound uh, iodi 800 cw um, Yeah. So we call it the ICON trial. Um, why, why do we use this tuximab targeting EGFR? Because we know that uh, over 90% of the uh, oral squamous cell carcinoma uh, uh, do overexpress the, the EGFR. We cut the study in two phases, in the phase one and the phase two. Um, the phase one is uh, published uh, um, around two years ago now, which, in which we investigated 15 patients, um, and it was mainly focused on uh, finding the right dose and the, the dosing schedule. And last December, the phase two uh, um, uh, have been completed we included uh, 68 patients with this in, uh, in our field, uh, uh, the largest uh, clinical study um, uh, investigating fluorescence guided surgery in hand and neck uh, patients. And um, the goal was to uh, provide a positive predictive value. Um, unfortunately, I have some very pre pre preliminary data on it because we're currently uh, um, on full speed analyzing the data and we expect to to publish our first results uh, anytime soon uh, and we um, um, uh, um, performed quantification of the intrinsic fluorescence because we believe that that only looking at fluorescence might not um, uh, be the best strategy uh, especially in those finding studies I will come back to that later. So how, how does the study uh, look? We uh, included five dose cohorts of three patients each. Um, first, we, we uh, did immediately the warm dose, uh, how we call it, so the cetuximab labeled to uh, um, iodide in uh, three different doses, the 10, 25, and 50 uh, milligrams. And uh, the, uh, the last two cohorts, it consisted of uh, patients who uh, received a pre-dose of unlabeled cetuximab, uh, uh, 75 milligrams, and uh, then followed by a, a labeled cetuximab dose of 15 or, or 25 um, milligrams. And that's uh, mainly um, done to um, uh, reduce the background fluorescence. So after two days, the, the surgery was performed. We performed a um, intraoperative imaging using the search vision camera. We performed ex, ex vivo imaging using the pearl. Um, and we performed, of course, a histopathological correlation between the fluorescence results and the, uh, the histopathological uh, uh, H&E slides. And everywhere where you can see an S, it stands for spectroscopy. We, we also performed the uh, um, spectroscopy. Uh, to obtain intrinsic fluorescence, and um, why is that? Uh, we believe that is important. Um, the intrinsic fluorescence is is in our um, group um, defined as correcting uh, for the optical properties of the tissue itself. So, which is mainly the scattering and the absorption. And here you can see on the left uh, what's happening to a fluorophore when it's um, uh, in the body and it's. Um, uh, it uh, it absorbs it and and and, and emits the uh, the LED um, um, from the camera. It's it scatters all along. It's absorbed. So so only looking at the, the fluorescence is, in our opinion, not enough. 
and on the, the image on the right you can see what what happens to the uh, fluorescence uh, when you change the the optical properties when you when you increase the absorption or you increase the scattering you can get completely different um, images of the fluorescence so especially for those findings we we believe that um, spectroscopy is an important parameter to uh, to investigate so how does it look? This is a um, in vivo uh, image of the fluorescence. You uh, can see here an, um, an image uh, obtained with a nanoscopic fluorescence imaging system, which is custom built uh, by us and, uh, and together with Munich again. Uh, and here you can see uh, uh, the floor of the mouth, um, uh, which shows a large tumor. Uh, and you see clear fluorescence at the tumor and, and no fluorescence at the healthy contralateral side. This is the open air system. So uh, when the um, tumor is accessible using uh, the larger camera head, we would prefer to use the, the open camera because the resolution is, uh, is way better. Uh, and you can see here a, a buccal, um, um, not a buccal, this is an, a tongue carcinoma, a lateral tongue carcinoma. Uh, and at the small yellow arrows, you can see a uh, second lesion, uh, which is a bit more anterior on the tongue, uh, which wasn't, uh, uh, the surgeon wasn't aware of the second lesion uh, prior to fluorescence imaging. So here you see immediately the, the strength of uh, using fluorescence during surgery. And both lesions were, were excised during surgery and, uh, and turned out to be tumor uh, indeed. Um, so this is uh, how it looks during surgery. <clears throat> I'm now going to show a uh, video uh, um, of, uh, of this, uh, this surgery as well. So here we see uh, on the, the small panel, we see the white light. This is the, the view the surgeon has uh, normally. And on the, the large um, view, you see the, uh, the fluorescence. Uh, you see again a lateral tongue carcinoma. And uh, the surgeon is cutting it with an electronic uh, knife. Um, to uh, first to uh, to set the the excision um, uh, borders and uh, he's he's using uh, the fluorescence to to guide him uh, where the to what the extension the tumor is uh, is present present. So again, not only looking at fluorescence but also uh, quantify it. Here we see uh, the um, intrinsic fluorescence results of the five different cohorts um, from left to right, uh, the unlabeled, uh, of the, the, only the labeled and on, on the right two columns we see the, the unlabeled followed by the labeled to them up. Uh, and we see a clear increase in the fluorescence uh, when increasing the dose, but we also see a clear increase in the background fluorescence when increasing the dose without a pre-dose. Um, I think when you look at the um, at the the tumor flu the background fluorescence here, uh, you see uh, the that the, the pre dose groups um, um, the background fluorescence re remains uh, really low uh, compared to the to the tumor fluorescence. So your your tumor to background ratio um, is way more solid. This is only the numbers. And again, when we, we take a look at the, the fluorescence visualization, you see here the real strength of the pre-dosing. Um, way less background fluorescence and the, the tumor is uh, way better delineated using the fluorescence where you see those two uh, examples of the pre-dose cohorts on the right bottom. Um, so based on these results, uh, we already uh, um, uh, um, wanted to choose the uh, uh, one of the two um, pre-dose cohorts, uh, those for our phase two study. And when we look at the, the ex vivo uh, specimens, again, on the, the right-hand side of this, uh, this slide, we see um, a very um, a low background fluorescence um, uh, in the pre-dose groups on the right, um, with increasing uh, tumor fluorescence. Um, and and um, because there was no clear difference between the uh, 75 plus 15 or 75 plus 25, we decided to go for the 75 plus uh, 15 uh, cohort uh, for our phase two study, um, by, by thereby limiting the, the chance of side effects and um, the exposure of the drug. 
And uh, on the left hand side, you again see here a very nice correlation between the tumor uh, and the fluorescence, and it correlates uh, to on the HE slide and the, the EGFR slide as well. <clears throat> so it's nice that it works, that we can light up uh, tumors, uh, but does it uh, really work in, uh, in the clinic? We here see, we here see a uh, freshly excised surgical specimen um, of a floor of mouth tumor. And when you go on the left uh, bottom uh, panel, you see a very clear fluorescent spot on the ventral resection side, which correlates to uh, tumor positive margin, as you can see uh, uh, on the H uh, and E slide. So here, uh, if the surgeon sees this during the surgery, uh, he can immediately act um, by um, uh, if, if, of course, uh, feasible and safe for the patient to obtain a little bit more margin uh, in, the, in the surgical cavity. So the results of this study, we included 15 patients. We detected four positive margins, which were in fact all four positive margins in this study. <clears throat> we saw one false positive, which correlated to uh, submandibular gland. We know that uh, the gland tissue expresses also a bit of EGFR, um, but we believe that's not a very big problem because uh, in general, uh, a surgeon can uh, discriminate tumor from, um, from these glands and we saw no uh, serious uh, tracer-related safety issues. <clears throat> so the phase two uh, recently uh, uh, finished. Um, we are a bit um, uh, searching for the optimal uh, TBR. We used uh, interoperative guidance uh, on the TBR of higher than two, which is based uh, on the uh, um, study of tumors uh, published in Theranostic in 2018. She uh, recommended at least a TBR of 1.5. We believe that maybe a TBR uh, higher than two might, might work better, but we are analyzing it. At least we identified all tumor positive margins again, 14 out of 14, and we identified uh, 11 out of 20 uh, closed margins. We again saw a bit of uh, uh, false positive margins, um, uh, mainly based on uh, the cost by, by glands. Uh, we see, saw one uh, false positive um, in an, uh, a previously transplanted uh, skin flap, which turned out to be the, the large artery um, uh, feeding the, the transplant. And we saw two lesions, um, uh, which we can't really uh, uh, explain. It might be that the, that it were uh, tissue optical properties or some scattering or reflection. Um, we don't know. So these numbers then are, are again very uh, preliminary, but um, we can say, I, I believe that we could potentially uh, improve the surgery in 30% uh, uh, of the, the patients, only based on, uh, on these tumor detection using fluorescence guided surgery. So uh, I think that uh, it's a huge amount of uh, patients which might benefit uh, from fluorescence guided surgery. So then I would like to continue uh, with another strategy um, we, we now focus on the monoclonal antibody and, and um, you, by, for using that you need to uh, know that it's uh, the, the, the tumor target uh, which you are investigating uh, and it needs to express EGFR uh, and, and uh, it would help if the, the normal tissue doesn't express EGFR. Um, but what if, if the, the normal tissue does express your target? or that no imaging compound is available for your target. Uh, you don't know what, what tumor you're facing, so you don't also don't, do not know um, uh, what, what expression profiles these lesions uh, do have, or that the, the tumor expresses the target really uh, heterogeneously, or that you don't know where the tumor lesion is um, uh, originating from. So then you can use another strategy, um, uh, a compound called the uh, ONM100, uh, which was developed by the, the group of uh, Jimin Gao and Bernard Summer at the UT Southwestern. It targets uh, basically the, the pH of the tumor. And we know that uh, tumors are uh, a bit more acidic uh, compared to healthy tissues because um, the Warburg effect, which is in fact uh, um, the, the, the thing that uh, tumors produ produce uh, lactic acid despite the presence of um, of uh, O2, um, and they 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 developed a compound which is uh, um, uh, which you can see on the right, 
uh, which is in an off state when the, the pH is higher than the threshold and which is in an on state when the pH is below the threshold. <clears throat> How does it work? It consists uh, of my cells, which are nicely aligned in the off state and where the fluorescent uh, compound is, uh, is located in the center and by quenching there's no fluorescence. When the, the my cells fall apart, the, they are getting unquenched and the fluorescence is, uh, is turned on. Here you can see it on an, in a microscopic image. On the left, you can see the micelles um, 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 in a, in a um, nicely, uh, um, uh, uh, which are which are the fluorescence compound is enclosed by the micelles because um, the pH is higher than the threshold, so they are quenching. No fluorescence is uh, is visible. And when the pH is below the threshold, the micelles fall apart and um, and the fluorescence is activated. They developed a uh, platform that they can uh, tune the, um, the threshold from uh, all pH uh, um, that you want. Um, and we are um, uh, the ones that, uh, that first uh, um, firstly uh, tested the, these, uh, th this compound uh, in the clinic. We, uh, because it's uh, tumor agnostic, uh, we believe um, uh, we we tested the, the the compound in a lot of uh, different cancer types. Of course, had a neck cancer, but also esophageal cancer, breast cancer, and colorectal cancer. We again divided the study in two parts. Part one is the dose finding, again five times three patients, and the part two was the dose verification of the optimal dose uh, decided in the first part. <clears throat> So if we look at the dose selection, we uh, we can see that there, uh, by increasing the dose, um, uh, a higher tumor to background ratio uh, um, were uh, were, find, were found, and um, because of uh, no clear difference um, uh, between the 1.2 and the point, uh, point 0.8, we uh, decided to uh, go for the 1.2, and um, um, this this dose we tested uh, in in again uh, another five fifteen patients, and here on the left you can see <clears throat> that the uh, the tumor uh, was uh, in in all patients uh, more fluorescence compared to the GS non tumor tissue. We can see that uh, there is a solid TBR of uh, four point five, which is uh, considered to be very high in in our field, and we uh, have a very uh, uh, Solid area under the curve um, in the ROC curve uh, by uh, of uh, 0 0.79, 0 0.97. Excuse me. So we are very uh, happy with these results. So then the uh, the, the images. Let me uh, talk you through this uh, this image. On the left, you see um, tissue specimens of uh, the representing. Uh, um, uh, cancer types, on the, you see head and neck cancer, breast cancer, geo cancer, and colorectal cancer. You see a very uh, um, um, sharp delineated uh, fluorescent lesion uh, at the tumor location, which is not, vis not uh, visible uh, in the healthy tissue, which is a column on the right, of the, the middle column actually. And we see again, um, and excuse me, the, the graphs have become a little bit small, but you can look it up uh, in, in the paper, uh, which uh, I have a reference on my last slide, uh, that in, in all tumor types, um, the tumor was more fluorescent than the, the adjacent uh, non-tumor tissue. <clears throat> so uh, again, how does it look in the patient? We, we see here uh, tongue carcinoma, um, and we will image both uh, both sides. So here you see uh, the fluorescent uh, lesion of a very large tongue carcinoma. The non-fluorescent part in the center was uh, completely necrotic, so no non-viable tumor uh, was was present there. And here you see the contralateral side, uh, which is clearly uh, way uh, way less fluorescent than the than the healthy side uh, than the than the tumor side. <coughs> Again, a tumor lesion. So of course, we validated um, microscopically. 
you can see a sharp delineation between the tumor and the and the stroma um, uh, where you can see that the tumor uh, is uh, really fluorescent um, sh showed in the green here and uh, the the healthy uh, stroma um, doesn't uh, show any fluorescence <coughs> so now it's getting interesting this is uh, some uh, um, two patients actually in where we detected um, tumor lesions that we uh, didn't expect uh, prior to the surgery. On the, the, the top image shows a, uh, the peritoneal uh, cavity, which is in fact the, the abdominal cavity. You look from the inside to the outside and you see there uh, at, the, at the arrowhead a uh, small lesion which uh, turned out to be a um, uh, metastasis of uh, colorectal cancer. And in the um, panel D, you see a surgical cavity after directly after uh, um, oral oral cancer surgery. You you look at the lateral tongue again, and you see a very clear fluorescent spot, which turned out to be a, a satellite uh, metastasis as well. How does it look um, once the specimen is excised? You can see here a, a breast cancer specimen after a lumpectomy. So you excise a, a part of the breast. And you see again uh, at the specimen a clear fluorescent spot, which corresponds to a, a tumor positive margin, which you can see on the, the right hand side of this image. Here you can uh, see the, uh, the tissue slices uh, after the pathology department has sliced it. We call it bread of slices because it's, uh, yeah, we, you can visualize it as a, as a bread which is uh, sliced. Um, and there you have all, all, all these slices of around four to five millimeter, uh, which are further processed um, towards uh, H&E uh, sections. But here we can see on the, in those uh, slides that, that we uh, detect some, uh, some fluorescence, um, which turn out to be all metastases, um, uh, which weren't detected by uh, preoperative imaging, which weren't detected by the uh, uh, pathologist. Which, which wasn't um, uh, uh, enclosed for further histopathological processing um, if, if we uh, didn't find it with uh, the fluorescent uh, imaging. So you can see here the clear uh, additional benefit of, of performing fluorescent uh, um, imaging during the pathology um, processing. So in this study, we had uh, nine tumor positive resection margins. Uh, which we all detected uh, in this uh, this study. Uh, of course, uh, no test is perfect. We and, and we also saw some uh, 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 negative resection margins uh, with fluorescence. So where do we stand uh, after um, uh, these two studies? Um, First, we can not only look at the, the primer, primary tumor lesion, but also uh, to the lymph nodes. We, uh, we analyzed it uh, in a sub-study. Uh, my colleagues uh, Funk and, uh, and, uh, and David uh, published recently a study um, uh, on um, persons guided surgery uh, performed on, on, on lymph nodes, and actually it works. You can look it up uh, by yourself. Um, it's uh, published in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine. We, um, we believe that standardization is, is key in our field. Um, and a nice paper to read uh, um, uh, on that is uh, published by uh, our colleague uh, Heyman, also in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine. And we know that um, the imaging results are, are largely um, um, influenced by um, um, yeah, the most stupid things, like the, the distance from camera to patient, the angle of the, the light, the, the, the environmental light at, at the OR, the um, uh, detector head, the angle of the detector. So um, we believe that standardization is key to, to bring this field uh, uh, further. And, and in that regard, we, we should think um, of, of the, um, uh, the idea um, if we should go for, for in vivo imaging or that, that for a lot of indications, ex vivo imaging, where the, the environment is, is much more controllable, um, might, might suffice as well.
we need um, uh, hardware uh, uh, changes or, or improvements uh, which would generate uh, information on the depth of the fluorescence. And we believe that, that only looking at the fluorescent lesion alone um, um, does not um, uh, give us enough information because the fluorescence can, can come from a couple of millimeters below the surface, which is actually enough margin in, in some tumor types. So a strategy for that is to obtain directly a, a guided, a fresh frozen sectioning guided by the fluorescence. Um, which then can be analyzed uh, using 3D uh, fluorescent imaging. Um, and in, in the future, in the, the not too far distant uh, uh, future, I, I believe that, that, that upgrades and, uh, are, are mandatory and they are coming on, on devices which generate uh, 3D information uh, on the fluorescent uh, compound. And again, um, we believe that ex vivo uh, might be, um, in some cases, preferred uh, over in vivo imaging. Because we, we think that's a better controlled imaging environment, then we can immediately combine the expertise of the surgeon and the pathologist uh, and still enable uh, real-time uh, data acquisition. We published uh, uh, a couple of, uh, of papers on that, uh, which are uh, as shown here, um, and, and a nice read for you if you're interested in this um, this field is uh, our recently published uh, perspective in the NDME, which is shown here in the, on the purple uh, with the purple header. So the next step we believe is to to go for specimen driven margin assessment, which uh, still allows interoperative margin control which allows combined expertise of the pathologist and the surgeon. Um, and um, we, we call it the uh, intraoperative pathology assisted surgery. So th this is where we believe that the field is going um, for, for our indication, head and neck uh, margin assessment uh, uh, in the coming, uh, coming years. And as I started my presentation, uh, I also uh, would like to, to finish it. Of course, uh, this is not only my work, it's uh, a huge team uh, behind it. We've got a, uh, a couple of uh, PhD students, I believe now around uh, 15 uh, to 20 uh, PhD uh, candidates. And uh, those four uh, guys um, yeah, were um, a great help in, in performing these studies. We've got three principal investigators, uh, which uh, are uh, very, very uh, helpful. And, and uh, the study, uh, performing a study, uh, it's key that, that your um, non, non principal investigators, but the surgeons uh, are, are more than willing to participate because it costs time, it costs extra work um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the startup uh, years. Uh, and of course, uh, all the, the assisting departments like the hospital pharmacy, pathology, et cetera. Um, so big thank to them as well. Um, and then I come to uh, to the end of the presentation. If you are interested in this uh, this field, uh, I would recommend uh, those four uh, reads. Um, but if you uh, go on PubMed and you 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 search my name or or one of the the PIs, you you find a lot of interesting uh, papers as well. Um, so I think um, I give back the word to Marie now and um, we can go for a Q&A session. Thank you, Dr. Vosco, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, is imaging limited to surface layers? Is it possible to work with deeper tissues? And if so, to what depth? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Thanks for that. Uh, yes, it, it is. The, the um, uh, techniques we are using, uh, imaging is, is possible a couple of millimeters into the tissue. Um, it's reported up to six uh, millimeters. I think that's a bit optimistic. I would say two to three millimeters um, max four. But there are um, uh, upcoming new techniques. Um, 
I'm not, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but the, the MSOT system de developed by the group of uh, Facilis Integritos, uh, which is using um, uh, sound, uh, 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 ultrasound uh, uh, wavelengths um, uh, to generate uh, uh, deeper tissue penetration. So the laser is um, is emitting um, wavelengths and it's, uh, the, the vibrations are detected by, by ultrasound. And it's reported that you can can image um, um, in up to one one centimeter. So that's really interesting. Um, so if you're interested in the, in that, um, um, look uh, look for some papers of uh, facilities group. Great, thank you. Next question: Would using labels with higher wavelengths in the near infrared reduce scattering and improve the signal and or detection? Uh, yeah, that's a good question as well. Uh, in theory, yes, we know that uh, the higher wavelengths, and it's, it's called uh, the near two uh, area, which starts from around uh, 1,000 nanometer, um, faces uh, uh, a lot less uh, scattering. So currently, there are not that many devices uh, which uh, which are uh, able to detect uh, those uh, those uh, far and near infrared wavelengths we uh, actually uh, are performing a, a study now using um, a near two um, of which the results will be the first results will be uh, presented at the uh, european molecular imaging meeting um, in greece in um, in a month from now so then i um, hope to speak to you uh, more on this topic. Awesome, great. Um, and it looks like we have time uh, for just a couple more questions. This next question has multiple parts, so if you want me to repeat any of them, uh, just let me know. Uh, it says, I wonder how did you select your regions of interest when quantifying the data, both for tumors as well as for the background to calculate TBRs? Was it ex vivo or in situ? What advice would you give to avoid bias when selecting ROIs and performing quantification? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think uh, one of the most important uh, topics, uh, especially when, when you're, you're analyzing a uh, uh, compound for the first time, um, so we did uh, backwards planning, uh, so to say. So first we uh, uh, asked the pathologist to uh, delineate the tumors on the h &E section without knowing any fluorescent results. And then we overlaid those uh, those h &E sections uh, on the uh, tissue slices, of which we collected fluorescent images, uh, images. So it was ex vivo, because I believe that um, for a TBR um, uh, calculation, uh, a selection of the RI in vivo, of which you don't have any histology, isn't that reliable. It's it's nice to to look, but to prove that that you have a solid TBR and 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 that uh, the fluorescence is only uh, taken up in the tumor and not in the surrounding tissue, you need to um, uh, have histology uh, data. And that's only feasible. Uh, for, uh, that's only um, uh, available uh, ex vivo. So we we first uh, asked the pathologist uh, to delineate on the H and E section, and then we look back on our fluorescent imaging. I hope that answers your question, uh, Lucas. Great. Thank you so much. And it looks like um, we have we have time for one more question. What is the minimum size of tumorous tissue that can be detected? That is a great question. That that I think it depends on the resolution of your your camera as well, and and of course of the um, um, quality of your your compound. Um, in the first study where we, which we used uh, cetuximab, we detected a tumor lesion of around uh, two millimeters. Uh, and in the, the second uh, study I showed, um, we were even able to detect a 1.5 millimeter uh, satellite lesion. So um, yeah, around uh, one, two, three millimeters um, when using these uh, the, the current devices available. Great. And we actually have time for one more question. Um, are you planning to validate these techniques in other centers? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think now um, the phase two is uh, is finished in our center, which are uh, almost 70 patients. That's uh, that's a lot in our field. Um, the the study wa was uh, was open for I think three and a half years. We had some hiccups, so you can imagine that. Uh, already, uh, but but we we believe that that when if you want to prove that it's a feasible technique for for not only academic centers but for all uh, surgeons, you you need to prove that it's um, not only um, working in my hands, but um, um, you should run a, a solid uh, phase three study. We are now in the in the orient uh, orientating phase. Uh, we have some some really nice other head and neck centers in the Netherlands, maybe also uh, other um, uh, centers in, in, in Europe uh, to uh, to go for a phase three uh, trial multi-center. So um, I hope that we can initiate that in the, the upcoming uh, period. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Dr. Vasco, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Andor, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.